All right, the book of Isaiah this morning, Isaiah chapter number 6, if you would. Isaiah chapter number 6. So school has been going on for a couple of months now. Has report, have report cards come out yet for the uh, school? Anybody know? Anybody got? First one has, yeah. By the way, we're glad to have Matt Fry back. He's uh, finished up his tour of duty, and uh, he's back home for a couple of months before he goes off to college. So that's good to have him here. He looks great. And we're thankful for that. Anyhow, I heard about this uh, elementary school teacher who found out uh, who who found it hard to maintain a straight face. A little boy came in and told her, said, "Miss Hayes, I don't want to scare you, but my dad said if my grades do not improve, somebody's going to get a spanking." <laughs> and he thought it was going to be her, but it's going to be him, I guess, in that regard. We. Um, Glad that you made it out here this morning, and we want to speak this morning on how to meet with God. Every Sunday morning, uh, millions of Christians around the world, for that matter, gather together for the purpose of worshiping God. We have come here this morning to worship the Lord. Now, there's many different kinds of churches, of course, all sorts of different names of churches, There's big churches, there's little churches, there's city churches, there's country churches. Uh, uh, There are some churches who meet in multi-million dollar facilities. There are some churches who meet in a rented storefront building. There are some who have loud worship services. And there are some who are more contemplative uh, uh, services. And, And... the you know there there's one common denominator however in all of that is that we have come to worship the lord jesus christ we have come to worship the god of heaven now i'll say to you that every every worship service has two kinds of worshipers in it every worship service has two kinds of worshipers in it number one uh those who have a worshipful experience And then secondly, those who simply go through the motions. There are those who are going to leave here today and said, Wow, uh, I I had a truly worshipful experience. And there are going to some who are going to say, Well, uh, you know, that was kind of just went through the motions today, didn't it? I believe, however, that those who just go through the motions really would like to have a worshipful experience. I believe that with all my heart. Uh, 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 we want our worship to be a dynamic experience. We want it to be something that that uh, 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 we experience that, that gives us great joy and great hope and, and, and it thrills our soul in essence. But there are some who sit there and they're just empty and bored to death. What is the deal? What is the deal? If we could take a poll when we left here this morning, If we could take a poll of each person and we could say to that person uh, that uh, we could say, hey, did you have a worshipful experience? And we might have uh, many that would say yes, and we might have some that would say no. Matter of fact, if we could have people describe what they uh, experienced while they were at church, and then we looked at all the results afterwards, we might say this. Were they all in the same place? Were they all in the same service? What in the world happened? What's, what is the difference? What makes the difference between having a worshipful experience and not having a worshipful experience? Well, you must remember this morning that the most important element in, in, in worship is the heart of the person attending worship. The Bible says that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It, what, what is so much important or the, what is most important is your heart and, and, and how you came even this morning. Were you ready to receive a blessing or did you expect to be bored out of your mind? Is it going to be a worshipful experience for you this morning? Or when you leave here, you're going to say, well, we just kind of went through the motion. I kind of went through the motions here this morning. Yeah, I sang and, you know, this and that and the other. But it was just uh, it was just a time of going through the motions. Well, here in Isaiah, we learn some things about worship that I want us to be reminded of here this morning. Look at Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. 
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of Him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. All right, so we're going to learn some things of worship, about worship this morning from Isaiah chapter 6. The first point, you'll see it up here on the board, and you may want to write this down, that worship is an act of reverence. Worship is an act of reverence. And how important that is. We know, of course, that there are two, there's many attributes and aspects of God's character, of course, that we know about. But I want to remind you of two here this morning. First of all, it is is the... the, uh, uh, Attribute of the transcendence of God. The transcendence of God. Now just bear with me. I'm going to explain this so you'll understand it. But we call it the transcendence of God. This is uh, uh, about God is the fact that He is above and beyond anything earthly, natural, or finite. When we talk about the transcendence of God, we talk about the fact that He is above everything. Above everything. Uh, uh, and we know that, of course, to be true. You know what Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says? For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we have the transcendence of God that He is above everything. His thoughts are not our thoughts. The heavens, As the heavens are higher uh, than the earth, so are, is God higher than us. Now, then there's also the eminence of God. So we have the transcendence of God. He's higher. And then we have the eminence of God. And the eminence of God is this. It is the fact that God is present in every part and moment of the created universe. In other words, He is not removed from what is going on. He is very much involved. So, we see the transcendence of God, that He is above everything, but we see the eminence of God, that He is involved in everything. Now, those two things are not contradictory. They are, and both extremes are absolutely true. Psalm 138.6 says this, Though the Lord be high, yet hath He respect unto the lowly, or He regards the lowly. Psalm 113 verse 5 says, Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high, who humbleth Himself to behold the things that are in heaven, and that are in the earth? Now, so we know that God is transcendent, He is above everything, but we know He is imminent, He is involved in everything. Now just hang tight. There's been a lot of teaching, of course, on the imminence of God, that He's involved. You know, people talk about He's my friend, and He's our personal Savior, and He walks with me, and He talks with me, and all of this is absolutely true. But I'm going to tell you this morning, for you to have a truly worshipful experience, we are going to have to think about the transcendence of God. We're going to have to think about His majesty, His awesomeness, His holiness. And I'll remind you this morning, if you want to truly worship God, you're going to have to come into this room here this morning and realize that God is greater than me. He is greater than anything. Matter of fact, He is greater than anything you or I could ever even think about here this morning. He is greater than we could even comprehend with our mind. He is more magnificent than we could ever describe. And I'll remind you this morning also, if you come in here and you want to have a worshipful experience, you are going to have to remember that God is good. And God is good beyond description. And He is good all the time here this morning. One of the things that Satan wants to get us on, 
boy, he, he, has, he has fun trying to get at us on this, is for us to forget that God is good. And then what happens? See, we have something happen in our life, and, and then the devil comes along and says, well, boy, if God was really good to you, he wouldn't allow that to happen in your life. If God was really good to you, he wouldn't let that happen in your life. So God doesn't love you. And so then we say, well, I'll show God. I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, I'll just go out and do something that I know I'm not supposed to do. Or, or I'll say something I, I know I shouldn't say. Or I'll just act in a way that I know I shouldn't act just to get back at God. That's the way people do so. See, because Satan gets us to remember how good God is. And if you want to have a truly worshipful experience here this morning, if you want to walk out of here in just a few minutes and say, Wow! Man, uh, you know, God met with us, and, and I'm so thankful that I came to worship today because it was truly a worshipful experience. You're going to have to remember that God is good and He gives perfect gifts. You're going to have to remember that God is powerful beyond description, and He is holy beyond description. That He is completely independent of this world. His involvement with humanity is purely by choice. Uh, he doesn't need to meet with us, but He chooses to meet with us. He doesn't have to uh, do anything for us, but He chooses to love us. And he, and he didn't have to die on the cross for us, but He chose to die on the cross for us. Isaiah recognized this. It says, in the, year, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. I saw the Lord. He was overcome, overcome with an awareness of God. He saw God in His majesty. It says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. He saw God's greatness. His train filled the temple. He saw God's supremacy. Uh, uh, talking about the seraphims uh, who stood. The seraphims there in, in attendance. He talked about His His holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And He talked about His glory. Uh, the glory uh, of the Lord. The whole earth is full of His glory. And so, worship begins with reverence or revering God. Listen, reverence means that we have the right attitude toward God. I don't know if you're like me, but if I hear somebody talk about God like He's the, he's the man upstairs or He's the big guy or something like that, I tell you what, I, I want to punch Him in the nose. Uh, because I'm just telling you right now, that is 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 something that just just gets to me. He's not the he's not the man upstairs. He's not the big guy. He's not some higher power up here that you know people talk about. Let me tell you something. He is the absolute God, absolute holiness, absolute love, absolute judgment, absolute mercy, and he is worthy of our praise and our adoration. The Bible says that we should make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye lands, uh, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us. Did you know that? He's the one that made us. And not we ourselves. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving. Into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And His truth endureth to all generations. If you want to have a worshipful experience when you come to church, it's going to start off with reverence. Revering God, seeing God for who He really is, and revering Him, and realize and say, wow, He is awesome. He is awesome. That'll get you started. Secondly, we see here in Isaiah, once he was overcome with a sense of reverence for God, then he's overcome with a sense of unworthiness. So secondly, worship is an act of confession. Worship is an act of confession. An act of confession. Now, there's a story over in Luke chapter 5 of Simon Peter and uh, some others being out fishing. And uh, in Luke chapter 5, they'd been fishing all night. How many of you like to go fishing? Anybody like to go fishing? A few of you like to go fishing. Uh, uh, I, I used to like to go fishing, but guess what? The fish don't bite when I go anymore. So I just said, well, I'll forget. i just forget. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I just go out there and drown a bunch of worms. Uh, Y'all ever done that before? Uh, you know, that's, that's all we did. Anyhow, Simon, Peter, some others are out fishing. They've been fishing all night, and you know how much they caught? Zero, zippo, nilch, none, zero. 
Then the Lord is there on the, on the seashore, and he hollers out, and he says, Hey, throw the net on the other side. And they, he don't even realize at first that it's the Lord. Peter does. Throw the net on the other side. And you can see Peter right now saying, what? Who is that? What in the world is he talking about? I have, I'm a professional fisherman, that's what Peter would say. And I've been out here fishing all night, and I hadn't caught anything. And somebody, somebody on the seashore wants to tell me how to do it. Y'all ever been like that? I don't know if anybody uh, goes bowling with Willard, you know, and Willard bowl for, what, 100 years or whatever. And, 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 and then somebody wants to take Willard over, hey, let me show you how to do this. Keep your mouth shut. Even if he's messing up, he, he knows how to fix it eventually. Okay. Uh, but anyhow, uh, so who is this up here? And so, you know, unenthusiastically you can see Peter throwing that net on the other side. Well, all of a sudden, you know what happens? The net just fills up with fish. I mean, so, so many, and they start getting it into the boat, and the net is breaking because there's so many fish in there. And, 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 and then Peter looks up, and he realizes who that was that told him to throw it on the other side. And it was the Lord. And do you know what he said? The Bible tells us that Peter fell down at Jesus' knees, and he said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. See, Peter saw the Lord in a, in a different way. He realized that he's not just a man, he is God. And when he saw himself that way, he said, Depart from me, I am a sinful man. Listen, there's something about being in the presence of God that makes us aware of our own unworthiness. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you this much, the closer you get to God, the more of a sinner you realize that you are. Isaiah came to this realization, and in verse number 5, he says, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Uh, Isaiah recognized that his guilt was genuine. And, and what did he do when he saw his unworthiness? See, he saw the Lord, and he, and he saw uh, how majestic and how wonderful God was and how, how powerful He was. He saw the Lord in the right kind of way, uh, in, a, in a reverent spirit. And then he saw his un unworthiness. And so what did he want to do? He wanted to confess that he was a sinner. He said, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. You know what Isaiah was doing? He was just agreeing with God that he was right. And we're wrong. That's actually what confession actually means. Did you know that? It just agrees with God that He's right, what He says about things. You know, and, and you know what God's right about? Here's what God's right about. People say, well, I can sin and I can get away with it. Or I can sin and there'll be no consequences. And let me tell you something. You cannot sin and get away with it. You cannot sin and there not be any consequences. And so when you sin, and then you see the consequences that your sin has brought into your life, and then you see God for who He is, then you will confess and you will agree with God that He was right, that there are consequences to my sin. And we'll say the same things about our sin that God says. I love 1 John 1, 9 again. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, worship is an act of reverence. We see God, and then we see how unworthy we are, and so then we confess that we are unworthy. And then, God brings grace into our lives, which is the third point. Worship is an act of grace. An act of grace. Because in verse number 6, one of the seraphims flew to Isaiah, having a live coal in his hand, and he laid it upon his mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and, notice verse 7, Thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. So, we come in, we revere God, we reverence God, we confess that we are unworthy, we confess our sin to God, and then God brings grace into our lives. He brings forgiveness into our lives. I'll remind you that even worship is something you can't do on your own. You cannot worship without His help. You cannot worship without His grace. Grace is that undeserved favor. 
That undeserved favor that God brings in our lives. You don't deserve His love. You don't deserve His mercy. You don't deserve uh, uh, His forgiveness. Uh, You don't deserve His grace. But He gives it to you freely, freely here this morning. Worship is an act of grace. This this idea of, of touching His lips and His iniquity being taken away, it's symbolic of what Christ has done for us. And uh, through His death, our sins have been blotted out, of course, and our guilt has departed. Matter of fact, Hebrews 10.10 says, We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, there's a lot of people who say, Well, as soon as I get my life straightened out, you know, I'll think about coming to God. That is absolutely backwards, folks. What you do is you come to God and then He helps you straighten your life out. Uh, That's exactly what He does. And, 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 and some people say, well, I want to get to the point where I can deserve His grace. You will never deserve His grace. There is none of us that deserves His grace. Even the best of us in here this morning do, do not deserve His grace in our lives. You can't do it. It's, for by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And see, if you want to have this great relationship with God, you want to have this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, then you must receive His gift of grace. And see, that's just, that's just the start. It's a whole life full of grace that God brings to you in your life. And then finally this morning, I'll share with you that worship is an act of service. An act of service. Verse number 8 says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. Let me tell you something. Uh, uh, you know, and, and many people got the wrong idea. They say, Well, I've, uh, I've, I've worshipped the Lord this week. I, I went and I sang a few songs and I listened to a sermon, so I've worshipped the Lord this week. Let me tell you something. Worship is more than that. Worship is a whole lot more than that. Matter of fact, worship is more than just following a ritual. Ritual. There are certain churches, of course, that even put in their bulletin when you're supposed to stand and when you're supposed to sit, when you're supposed to kneel, when you're supposed to do this. And people just follow this ritual and they, they think and when they leave, hey, I have, I have worshipped the Lord. Let me tell you something. Worship is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. Christianity is a relationship. Worship is a lifestyle. Um, you ever been just kind of beat down through the week? And this world will beat you down through the week. It'll beat you down. Uh, uh, we have to deal with people. Do people ever beat you down? We deal with people. We deal with things on our job. We deal with taxes. We deal with traffic. Traffic. We deal with decisions. We deal with family situations. And let me tell you something. I, I want to still, I want to come here and praise the Lord, but I want to praise the Lord on Monday when I'm stuck in traffic. I want to praise the Lord when, when I've got situations that come into my life that I really don't like, but I still want to be able to praise the Lord. I want, I want to not just praise the Lord here, but I want to praise the Lord all week long. I want something, that's, and, and, and I want my worship experience that I have here to carry me through the week. I want my worship to also carry go with me day by day as I go out into the world. I want you to think about something. When two people get married, two people get married, and uh, we, we've got some people who are married here, we've got some people who are widowed or widowers here uh, uh, that's been married, I may have some divorced people here this morning, uh, you've been married, uh, we've got some people here that, that can't wait to get married. We um, talk about marriage. You, you've either been at your wedding or you've been to other weddings. When you go to a wedding, two people stand up in front of the preacher and they publicly vow to love, honor, and cherish one another until they're parted by death. The success of the marriage depends upon the couple's Commitment to this vow. Did you hear me? The success of the marriage depends upon the couple's 
commitment to the vows that they made in a public way before God and before others. Now, some marriages today, some weddings today, uh, you know, are lavish. There's, there's weddings today where people spend thousands and tens of thousands of dollars on weddings. Tens of thousands of dollars on weddings. Uh, uh, there are, uh, uh, again, uh, marriages and weddings, I should say, that are just lavish. You know, they have them at, at certain places. And I mean, man, all the color is coordinated and everything is just right. And I mean, it's just a, it's a big time affair. It's the social event of the year, in essence. Let me tell you something. The success of the marriage has nothing to do with how much you spend on the ceremony. It has nothing to do with how much or, or what color the bridesmaids' dresses were or who was or who wasn't in your wedding. Matter of fact, we have weddings today, you know, where people come and, and they may have, you know, some may have 20 at their wedding, some may have 100, some may have two or 300 or 400. Who knows? It does not matter who or how many came to your wedding. That does not change anything to do with the success of your marriage. I'll remind you this morning that if the bride and groom, both of them, if both of them aren't serious about their wedding vows, then the whole, the whole uh, wedding is a charade. It's a charade. And it's a waste of money. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of time. Who in the world would go and spend thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars on a on a wedding and then not be serious about the vows? But let me tell you something, it happens all the time. That is an absolute waste of money, and it's a waste of time. A good marriage is not determined by a fancy wedding ceremony. Now, if you want to have that and have that, it's all good. But that's not, that, that does not mean you're going to have a wonderful marriage. It is determined, a, a, a good and great marriage is determined by the level of commitment that the bride and groom have for one another. That's it. It, it hasn't been just in the last few years where these weddings have gone, you know, just crazy. My wife and I got married on a Friday night. It's, it's kind of unusual. We got married on a Friday night, and uh, 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 we had, I don't know, 100, 125 people maybe at our, our wedding 40 years ago. And we just had the traditional type thing. You know, we had five or six bridesmaids and five or six groomsmen. And, and, and then we uh, had a little reception, and uh, we didn't even feed them a big meal or nothing. It was just some cake and some peanuts and stuff like that. Forty years later, guess what? We're still together. How did it happen? We didn't have some big fancy uh, smudge wedding. It was just a little old thing. Wasn't a whole lot of money spent and that kind of thing. What happened? It was the commitment. That we made one to another. That we were not going to let anything get in the way of having a good marriage, a great marriage. All right, you say, what did you say all that for? Well, in the same way, the music that we have here today, the prayers that we said here today, the brilliant preaching that you've heard here today, I was supposed to laugh a little bit. The brilliant preaching that you've heard here today, whether you agree with that statement or not, it is brilliant. The music, the prayers, the preaching that you've heard today, listen, it's just pomp and circumstance if when you leave here, you don't have a stronger commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ to serve Him in the week ahead. Christianity is a come and go affair. We come to church, we go out to serve. We come to the mountaintop, and then we go back down again into the valley as Moses did. We come to worship, but then we go out to serve. Romans chapter 12 says, 
I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Or we could say it like this, present your bodies a living sacrifice to the Lord, which is your spiritual worship, which is your worship for the week ahead. We come uh, uh, to, to get excited, to, to have the thrill of worshiping God as a corporate body, and then we leave here and we say, boy, I am excited about serving the Lord. I want, to, I want my worship to be tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, and then we meet together again as a body. But I'm going to worship the Lord every day. Mrs. Billy Graham, it is said, I don't know if she still has this or not, but she keeps a sign or kept a sign above her kitchen sink that says, Worship service is held here three times a day. Because you see, worship is not a one day a week event. It's a lifestyle. It's an attitude that says, Here am I, Lord. Send me. That's what Isaiah said. Now, we can cultivate this lifestyle. We can have the right kind of worshipful experience in our life. When you get, first of all, you've got to get a right view of God. And when you get a right view of God, we get a right view of ourselves. We get a right view of God. We get a right view of ourselves. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then we become candidates for His grace. For by grace are you saved, the Bible says. And then, after we get His grace in our life, then we go out to serve. That's the way God set it up. So worship is first reverence, confession, and, and then it's um, the third point just went right out of my head. Grace and then it's service. That's what it is. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.